innovation. And that requires very, very different skills and competence of the organisation, which is why you often see different organisations in, um, being important at the different stages. Quite often you hear the question that which is a better strategy, being first to market or late to market? Which do you think would be best? First to market? Anyone else? I know that. Ha put the hands up. Who thinks first to market is a better strategy? Who thinks second to market is? And a number of people on the on the shelf on the um, on the fence. Actually, it, it depends on the time scale. If you look at the total life of the, the sales volume and the sales revenue from a technology, actually the late to market wins. But to be honest, what actually happens in the short term, first the market is often very good or a fast follower. Um, and the reason why late to market often um, benefit is because the first to market actually move on and they leave the market to others because they're interested in new products, not mature products. So there's probably a reason and explanation for that. So actually, um, long term, late to market companies do well because they end up getting large sales volume um, whereas early on you get high profits but smaller sales volume. One of the best strategies you see is what you call fast follower. So neither late or first. And the fast follower means that you, you need very similar skills to the first to market. You're still focusing on product innovation. But what you do is you let the first to market make the mistakes, which is what I think what you were saying. Um, you learn from those mistakes, plus you allow the first to market organization to open up the market for you. It's actually very, very expensive to open up a market. To, to establish primary, dema primary demand is very expensive. So if you can actually allow another company to do that without them establishing their brand too much, then, then uh, you can actually learn and benefit from that. However, if you get there in first and you can influence the standards, regulations, you can actually sometimes lock markets into your product. If you've got a very strong brand like Microsoft, you can knock your, you know, the whole market. I mean, it's, it's been very difficult for companies to um, unlock my, Microsoft's hold on the marketplace. It looked like it might happen with Netscape, and it didn't. It's looking like there might be possibilities with recent things happening in, in, um, in the operating system market. So Microsoft's days may be numbered, so I, I might sell your shares if I were you. Um, one of the key things in Europe, um, I'm not sure it's happened in America, but if you, um, when you buy a Microsoft operating system now, when you first log on, because they, they, basically you, you get your computer with Microsoft, so in many ways you're already locked into the market. When you first sign on now, um, when you get a new computer, it, you're actually told, you're actually asked, which of this variety of products, is it Firefox and all these ones, so it's not automatically loaded on your machine. You have to choose it. I think that's European legislation. But in Crete, what you're seeing in, in Europe now is actually the stranglehold that Microsoft um, had is starting to fade because people have got a choice when they, they log on now. Yeah. Um, so you, we might see change there. So there isn't really, you know, the, it depends on the sector, it depends on the circumstances, but... Um, the evidence or the jury is out on which is the best strategy, but there are different benefits and different disbenefits from being first or fast follower or late. You got it working again, thanks. So again, this is just the key features of the product process cycle limitations. I won't go through those details yet now. So, although I'm sure as we've been going through this, you're probably thinking, what I'm talking about is very abstract and what the hell is he talking about? But actually the things I'm talking about have serious implications for the strategy of an organization over 10, 15 years. And they're very important dynamic models which are not captured by many models you've probably, if you've done strategy, they're not really captured by the models you normally have in, in the strategy textbooks. Now the, the fourth model I want to talk about is something called the emergence of dominant design. 
Now what you see over time in many, many sectors is the emergence of a particular way in which we deliver a service, a particular way um, or a particular design in um, a product. Here's an example. It's not a very great, um, great picture, but we all think, perhaps, I certainly do, that the design of a bicycle is obvious. Yeah? There's two wheels, the same size, and isn't that an obvious design? But actually, if one looks back in history, prior to the design that led to the bike, this is, this is essentially um, the, the dominant design that emerged. But there are actually many, many different designs for bicycle which were there prior to... Um, 1890, I think it was. The penny farling, where you had that um, really huge wheel and a small one. Do you remember those? <laughs> no, I, I don't even remember those. Um, <laughs> there, were, um, there were many, many um, different designs of bicycles in the Victorian age, which are just absolutely incredible. When you see pictures from um, the 18. 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or, or photographs. It's incredible the, the variety of bicycles that existed. Um, but actually today, there really is one dominant design that all of us would recognise as a bicycle. So if, I'm sure if we, both, if we all were to draw a bicycle, it would all look pretty similar. Okay? So the dom there was lots of different strange designs. I mean, this one here with a middle wheel that's really big and two small ones. Uh, the penny farthing, all sorts of strange things. But this is what we would probably recognise as a bicycle. Um, and the same is true of all sorts of different products. If I could have done a similar diagram with cars, we all, I mean, today cars pretty much look the same, don't they? Four wheels and... Um, I know that we get told that they look very different, but they're pretty, pretty similar. Um, if we could look back in history, we would find all sorts of strange designs of cars. And so you could argue the car that we see today, in terms of where the engine is, often at the front, it tends to have four wheels, um, a roof. <laughs> you know, th these things are obvious to us, but really, what it, the reason it's obvious is because of the, a single dominant design has emerged. Yep. And that's quite important because if we tend to see in services and products, the emergence of dominant design, what that's saying is we need to make sure that we are part of that, because if we, if we actually are a manufacturer of bikes that look like this one, which oddly enough comes from Coventry, <laughs> John. <laughs> um, by the way, John's from Coventry in England yes. originally, <laughs> just in case you hadn't yeah. known. If you were a manufacturer of bikes like that, you wouldn't have survived very long probably. Yeah. So it does matter um, trying to look at the market and see which, which design emerges as, as the dominant design. Because if you are producing designs that are not matched to that, then the likelihood is you will die as an organisation, or at least that division might die. I'll come back to that example in a second. Um, a few minutes ago, I said that the emergence of a new technology wasn't just about technology revealing itself to us. It was a social process. And it's the same with dominant design. The design that emerges as, the, as one that dominates the marketplace is not necessarily the best technology. It's not just about consumers selecting what they want. It is shaped in all sorts of ways by organisations. And again, this is a key strategic dimension of the emergence of a technology or innovation. For example, companies that spend a lot of money on advertising and building the brand can lock a market into a particular design. Um, companies that set up very... Um, sophisticated and very broad distribution networks um, for ensuring that their product is pushed down to the market can help their product become the dominant design. If you can influence standards 
such that your standard becomes the standard which governments uh, set regulations about, then you, your product can become the dominant design. This is why, for example, lots of um, telecom companies a few years ago were heavily involved in trying to shape and influence the, um, the standards that existed in ways in which um, mobile phones communicated with each other. Because what they were trying to do is set the agenda, set the standards that match their products. Yeah? So when we look at the emergence of a, a single design of a product or a service, it's not just about how good the product is or how good the service is. It's how companies shape the marketplace such that their design or their product becomes the dominant product. Okay, so that's the fourth model. Over time, what we see is very early on, you have lots of products. We see that these eventually become what you call a dominant design. Having got a dominant design, sometimes that design can be stretched. And in the case of the bicycle, I don't know if you can remember these, um, the shopper, the chopper, the BMX, yeah? These are all actually variations of the dominant design, okay? And these are essentially niche markets. Okay, so these are not dominant markets, but the niches. So in terms of strategy, you want to make sure that you're not one of these other types of bike, but as a small company, you can enter the market late with a variation on that in a niche market. I won't go for the bicycles bit. Okay, the final model I want to talk about is the diffusion curve. And the diffusion curve is a way of mapping over time the diffusion of a new idea, uh, a new service, or a new product. And again, it doesn't have to be the private sector. It could be, for example, how we teach our children the alphabet. That's an idea and innovation. And, it, and there's lots of, innovation, sorry, lots of work on diffusion that looks at, for example, educational innovation. So it doesn't have to be a product or a service in the private sector. It could just simply be the diffusion of an idea. And just like um, with products where you end up with a dominant design, also with educational innovations, you end up with a dominant way of teaching. Yep. So it's not just about products and the private sector. So what you see over time is the product actually takes a long time to diffuse. But what's most interesting is the different groups in the diffusion process. Because these influence about, these influence who you try to market to. So at the very, very early stages of an innovation, for example, when the CD player first came out, it's very, very expensive, and the sorts of people that buy it were kind of geeks, technological geeks, you know. Um, and these people are not necessarily representative of the general market. Okay? What really leads to the diffusion, the rapid diffusion of an innovation and its adoption is this group here, the early adopters. Because the early adopters not only adopt an innovation early, but they shape the perceptions of others in the marketplace. They're often seen as opinion leaders. Now, if you think about fashion, it's often opinion leaders that le lead to rapid diffusion. So this group here are extremely important in the diffusion of a technology or an innovation or whatever. So early adopters in educational innovation might be schools that show that they are particularly successful in getting students uh, high grades. And other schools might say, well, they're, the, you know, they're very successful schools. Let's copy them. So understanding the different groups and identifying the different groups in diffusion can be really important because if you can market and shape 